Hey everybody and welcome to this reflective video of the Diplodocus by me, Oliver Cook. To start work on the Diplodocus, I first used various sources to research as much accurate information on the creature that I could find. This included detailed facts relating to how long the creature was, as well as the overall form of the creature, noting that the front legs are significantly shorter than the back. A great deal of information was gathered surrounding how the Diplodocus actually moved, specifically the fact that many depictions of the dino show it with its tail and neck in an S-curve pose and high in the air, which due to its skeletal and muscle structure would not have been possible. Real-world connections were made most prominently with the elephant, which somewhat had the structure of the Diplodocus, but in reverse order, having the shorter leg at the back. This real-world reference was important, as it is a grounded example of how certain aspects of the dinosaur may have looked. The workflow for the dino was created from a hybrid of various sources, and an idea from issue 49 of 3D Artist. In this issue, Andrew Baker, a concept artist for Weta, talks about concepting in 3D and how it can be very quick and very easily editable. Although this idea was not directly used, it was the inspiration for the colour concepts part of my pipeline, which uses a 3D sculpt render as a basis in Photoshop to apply colours for theory and testing. This method was later attempted, but results were never desirable, and eventually this stage was altered to use the masked image of the sculpt, as opposed to the actual full detail render. The base mesh was created using edge extrusion techniques, being guided by an image projected onto a plane for reference. I wanted to make sure that the mesh was going to subdivide well in ZBrush, so the image was posted on Polycount, in which some members pointed out that the side of the mouth would quite easily pinch when subdivided. This was fixed adding an extra loop, which also led to the much cleaner topology in the face as a whole. The polygon flow in the body was created using animation loops as reference, which enabled me to sculpt with a correct flow in ZBrush. The unfortunate downside with this base mesh is the neck and tail, which could have done with more resolution to accommodate the sculpt detail. A combination of brushes were used to create the base form of the dino. Clay tubes for blocking out form, the dam standard with the trim dynamics to help start form increases, and the flatten tool were used to create nodules on the back and ease the transitions between the skin flaps and the flat areas of the body. There were three real turning points in the sculpting of the Diplodocus which helped it to get where it eventually got to. The first is an article by Matthew Cooling on sculpting dinos for Planet Dinosaur. This article had tons of techniques, but most importantly this article made me aware of the power of layers. It was a combination of layers, masking, and using the noise modifier with alphas that created the surface detail of the dino. The use of layers allowed me to dial up or tone down some of the detail as and when I needed to, as well as to work iteratively with more control. The second big influence was these two images by Peter Minster. His work really helped me to understand some of the more difficult sections of the dino, most notably the folding skin at the front between the two legs. The sculpt also helped me recognise where more of the worn areas of the skin were, which better helped my alpha placement. The third thing which vastly improved the sculpt was a day that I spent taking a harsh analytical look to all of my forms and structures. I basically made alterations, copied the render into Photoshop, compared it, made paint overs, and then went straight back into ZBrush. This was repeated until I was happy with how it looked. By doing this, it helped me to develop my critical eye and made me rely upon my own judgement, which, if anything, got better. It was at this time that I openly admit to making a bad call. I could tell that the resolution of the neck was lacking severely in comparison to, say, that of the face and the body. Instead of taking the hit and subdividing further and living with reapplying my alphas, I decided to carry on thinking that any normal or diffuse texture projection that didn't quite work could be cleaned up in Photoshop. Once the sculpt was, in my mind, ready to be textured, a set of colour schemes were created. They mostly exhibited large areas of contrast with somewhat interesting designs. Unfortunately, the end result did not reflect these designs. The entire dinosaur was textured using polypaint with a cavity mask brush over the dark brown base, of which I discovered that I was unable to make any bright, interesting, or contrasting colours really work. I can't describe it, I, I would throw down a wacky colour and it would always come out garish and extremely unnatural. This meant that the resulting dino sticks very closely to similar hues and tones, not necessarily doing a good job of drawing the viewer's eye. Again, the resolution in the neck was glaringly obvious. To best plan for retopology, animation-ready meshes that held similar qualities to the Diplodocus were found, taking note of flow and structure to better plan out my own topology. The notorious deformation example by Ben Mathis was always at hand when creating topology for deforming areas, which has been my preferred tried and tested method. The retopped dino was created by hand using Rapid. Half the dino was retopped and unwrapped to allow more UV space for the now fewer islands. Once the half dino was used for projections from ZBrush, the dino was then mirrored to create a full retopped mesh. The base diffuse and normal maps were projected from ZBrush. 
The diffuse went through three iterations, which included a paint over to iron out some of the pixelated areas, adding some more interesting colors to the head, and overlaying multiple iterations of the normal map, which had been ran through the X normals normal to cavity filter. The specular map was created in the same way as the diffuse, using the normal to cavity maps to help bring out a lot of the detail that was in the surface detail of the dino. Initially, there was a problem in which certain parts of the map were blown out due to the layering, which was fixed by masking out certain areas to control the intensity. The normal map was created by overlaying it several times to increase the definition. The skin modifier was used to rig the dino to the cat rig using a combination of paint weights and absolute values. The animation uses a cat motion layer which has been heavily modified to fit the representation of the Diplodocus in the Walking with Dinosaurs series. To better achieve this, the video was ran through Canovia which allows you to draw over the top of videos. This helped me to understand just how the Diplodocus moves and how to adjust my dino's posture. I noted that a full cycle of the dino took a smidge over 3 seconds, which at 30 frames a second was about 100 frames. Testing in UDK was done frequently as to monitor the actual result in the destination format. At first a complex skin shader was used for the bulk of the dino, which was later changed to a much more simpler material structure using modifications to the specular to make the dino pop. The eye material is derived from V8 Matey's eye shader, which with a little help was modified to better suit the lighting environment in which it was going to be presented in. The animations were all imported using FBX, and one problem I had was my looping animations were jittering between the first and last frame. Normally I work in a 0 to 100 in max, and then remove the last frame, which is identical to the first, though for some reason this did not work, and the jitter remained. I eventually decided to export 0 to 98 frames, and the animation looped fine. The physics asset was a difficult task due to the length of the dino. A lot of the twist and rotation limitations had to be applied to the neck and the tail, as most of the time they would rotate constantly. Some more work could be done to this physics asset, but it works perfectly fine. The anim tree setup is very simple, with the addition of a random node to alternate between the two idle poses. The regular idle is set at 0.9, whereas the alternate is set at 0.1. This means that the more flamboyant animation of the two is not overplayed. This completed the dino's journey and its implementation into UDK. A polycount thread was kept throughout the process of creating this dino, as well as using the polycount Google Hangouts to get constant crits. The last post I made was somewhat of the earlier presentation stuff for the dino, although the majority of the criticism is actually aimed at the sculpt, stating that the forms still seem too blobby, and it seems like I've rushed into the detail. The user also comments that the dino looks too cartoony considering the references I've made uh, that were all realistic. I could not agree more with this user's analysis of my work, of which I feel like it's not up to any standard that would be used in industry. Just before going on to looking at other people's work and comparing it to mine, there are two big glaring issues that I'd like to point out. Um, the first one is down the front here with the normals. Um, I have no idea why why this is really happening. What I probably should have done is uh, taken more time with testing with the normals and, and trying to blend these two over a little better. If I'm not mistaken, I think 3D Coat has some kind of like painting normals tool, which I probably could have used here if I, I was able to paint the, and blend these normals out. Uh, this is a massive issue which really lets the model down. Another similar issue is this ring around here, which uh, I tried flipping the green channel on this uh, in order to, to iron this out, thinking that it was just the green channel kind of pointing the, the normals in the wrong direction, but you know, doing that did not help, it made it worse actually. Uh, which is interesting because it didn't happen back here and there is a massive seam going down the back, well, there, there isn't a seam, there is a cut in the UV island here, uh, as well as there is here, but this one is so much more prominent than this one, which I can't actually tell where I did it. So you know, yet again, more time on the normals here to try and figure out what this issue is and try to iron that out. But as you can notice from the side view here, that front normal problem is less apparent when you start getting into a profile shot, though, you know, th it's still a massive issue. When comparing my work to other students like Josh and Lucky, it is easy to see that their dinos are much more interesting to look at from a texture and model standpoint. Both exhibit bolder uses of colour as well as much more focused specular maps, especially around the face of Josh's dino. Their presentation is much more interesting than mine, really making the model pop out of the scene. This dino from Primal Carnage uses similar presentation style to me, using no floor, but overall the dino has tons more resolution and detail to show off, which my dino severely lacks. 
Even though the base color of the Primal Rage Dino is gray, it is still able to use a nice contrasting color to draw the eye, as opposed to my Dino, which remains the same level of saturation. All in all, I feel like my piece is subpar at best, and it's far from industry standard. In hindsight, the production could have been handled a lot less carelessly, and more time to be taken in presentation and texturing. Thanks for watching, guys, and uh, I hope you have a good day.